This is Twit. This episode of Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. 94% of CIOs and CISOs agree that attracting and retaining talent is increasingly critical. You can stay current on your IT skills at ACI. For individuals, use the code TWIT30 for 30% off a standard or premium individual IT pro membership at go.acilearning.com slash TWIT. So I suppose it was inevitable. Um, Though it happened sooner than I would have expected, the underground now has a chat GPT style generative AI all their own without any of the abuse prevention built into the front end that is in chat GPT. It is known, and I kid you not, as worm GPT, and it exists. The news of this comes from a reformed black hat computer hacker named Daniel Kelly, who collaborated with the team at the business email and messaging protection security firm Slash Next. Daniel begins his posting by providing a background about the use of legitimate generative AI like ChatGPT and discusses, as we have here, the fact that such AI can be hugely useful to bad guys when they're able to coerce it or seduce it into giving them what they want, meaning chat GPT, which, you know, is trying not to. But now it appears this will no longer be necessary. Daniel explains in his posting, he said, we recently gained access to a tool known as worm GPT through a prominent online forum that's often associated with cybercrime. This tool presents itself as a black hat alternative to GPT models designed specifically for malicious activities. Worm GPT is an AI based on the GPT-J language model, which was developed in 2021. It boasts a range of features, including unlimited character support, chat memory retention, and code formatting capabilities. Worm GPT was allegedly trained on a diverse array of data sources, particularly concentrating on malware related data. However, the specific data sets utilized during the training process remain confidential, known only to the tool's author and publisher. We conducted tests focused on business email compromise, you know, BEC attacks, to comprehensively assess the potential dangers associated once worm GPT or similar tools become more widely available and well known. In one experiment, we instructed worm GPT to generate an email intended to pressure an unsuspecting account manager into paying a fraudulent invoice. The results were unsettling. Worm GPT produced an email that was not only remarkably persuasive, but also strategically cunning, showcasing its potential for sophisticated phishing and BEC attacks. While appearing largely similar to, ta to chat GPT, Worm GPT is deliberately unbounded by any ethical boundaries or limitations. It will answer any question asked, will generate any form of document required, and will author any type of malware requested. This experiment underscores the significant threat posed by generative AI technologies like Worm GPT, even in the hands of novice cyber criminals. It renders them immediately far less novice in their presentation and skills. Generative AI can produce emails with impeccable grammar, making them appear significantly more legitimate and reducing the likelihood of being flagged as suspicious. And the use of generative AI enables the execution of much more sophisticated BEC attacks than could have been launched before. Even attackers with limited skills and inability to use the target's language can now use this technology making it an accessible tool for a broader spectrum of cyber criminals. 
And Leo, as I said, this happened sooner than I expected, but in retrospect, of course. You Do know? you know what the quality of the code is? I mean, so far, the code we've seen generated by other LLMs has not been superb. Well, it's been, it, it's, it, it's, it's not been bug free in the same way that if you ask. Well, worse it to than that, it's been kind of trivial. So it's not. I mean, in other words, there are plenty of people with the skills to write this code themselves. It just enables people who don't even have those skills to create some. Right, and so we would argue that this code was trained on code that was written by skilled people, and it is just regurgitating it. On the other hand, it's you know. It it uh, it is often producing credible code, and I think what we can what we we can expect to see is this will only get better going forward. So, anyway, it, it I guess it's it's the, the 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 point is we've often joked at like ransom notices, poor grammar, and you know, and you see, you know, you look if you take if you bother to read spam. It's ob it's often obviously spammy. Right? Oh yeah. Well, oh, yeah. we can expect that to go away now because it will be easy to to dump that this through um, a, a a a a large language model trained up in the target language, and it will, you know, clean up the the, the misspellings and and the bad grammar and make spam now become indistinguishable from you know legitimate email. So, on our radar. Um, Microsoft revoked more than 100 malicious drivers. And when you first encounter the headline, Microsoft revokes more than 100 malicious drivers, you know, that seems like great news, right? You know, whoo, 100 fewer malicious drivers now. But then you stop and think, wait a minute, before they did that, there were 100 additional malicious drivers floating around? You know, and then, and if there were that many more, then isn't this going to be just like bugs where we're never going to run out of them? And of course, malicious drivers could do anything they want with the system. Um, and that's, you know, that's not good. And then we recall that historically, Microsoft's track record of keeping these malicious driver lists up to date has been, shall we say, uh, you know, a bit less than stellar. Like, didn't we catch them for two years? Like, not bothering to update the list and then going, oh, yeah. Like, and then say, saying that they were going to, but even then they didn't, as I recall from a prior podcast. The problem is that all of the evidence suggests that there are far too many ways to get around Microsoft's driver signing. Bad guys apparently have no trouble doing it. Kernel driver signing apparently poses a much greater inconvenience for the good guys than it does for the bad guys, who simply arrange somehow to run a bypass. And in fairness, this isn't really Microsoft's fault, at least not today. They're still stuck with the original design from Windows NT. Now, consider that Windows NT was first released and the architecture was in place in late July of 1993. So July of 93, almost exactly 30 years ago, when the world, as I've often said, was a very different place. Consider that Netscape didn't invent SSL until two years after that in 1995. So yeah, a very different world 30 years ago. So NT's architecture, which considers peripheral drivers to be trusted peers running alongside it in ring zero, you know, that architecture did not foresee and could not really have foreseen the degree to which unknown and untrusted third parties would be creating what amount to kernel extensions. It should not be necessary to fully trust some random printer driver to the same degree as Microsoft's own kernel code. But the architecture of Windows NT, which is what we're still living with today, makes 
what has turned out to be a very poor assumption about the trustworthiness of drivers. Drivers are sacred. They were, they were designed that way. They're meant to be. But now everybody just includes them in random things that you install. And, you know, they're down in the kernel along with everything else that Microsoft created and with full ring zero privileges. So here's how Microsoft couches the current mess while at the same time taking more than 100 existing previously certified good and safe Windows drivers out of circulation. Microsoft said, the Microsoft Windows Hardware Compatibility Program, WHCP, certifies that drivers and other products run reliably on Windows and on Windows certified hardware. First reported by Sophos and later Trend Micro and Cisco, Microsoft has investigated and confirmed a list of third-party WHCP certified drivers used in cyber threat campaigns. Because of the driver's intent and functionality, Microsoft has added them to the Windows Driver.STL revocation list. Woohoo! The Windows Driver.STL list is part of the Windows Code Integrity feature. The file contains dry, digital signatures and lists of drivers that Microsoft has revoked. This stops malware from running in the Windows boot and Windows kernel processes. Driver.stl ships along with Windows but is not part of Windows. It cannot be turned off, tampered with, or removed from the system. Microsoft updates the contents of the revocation file. The updates are sent to Windows systems and users from Windows Update. Right, like every six months. The Windows Code Integrity feature validates the source and authenticity of the drivers that run in Windows. The feature uses digital signatures to verify the integrity of Windows files and drivers. It prevents the loading of unsigned or tampered files. Windows Code Integrity and the Driver.STL revocation list have existed alongside Windows since Windows Vista. Okay, so what this all means is that, as Microsoft themsev themselves say, WHCP certified signed drivers are being used in cyber threat campaigns because driver signing is no longer workable. I mean, it's not useful. They're having to do blacklists of drivers, digital signatures, listing them in this file, and they just added more than 100. I checked. Their previous update was December of last year. So we're getting these fixes in large batches, less than twice per year. And unfortunately, this really isn't adequate, but it's what we've got. And I don't see anything that they can do now. They can't change the way NT's architecture is. We're stuck with it. You know, they're no long, they're no more, more able to change NT than Intel could decide to give up on its x86 family and do something else. You know, this is, you know, old legacy architecture dating back three decades and all windows is based on it they keep changing you know the api layers moving that all forward from win32 win, win and dot net and you know and and then you know a, a whole series of evolutions on top of this fundamental architecture and unfortunately the way it's been designed, they're allowing people to write whatever they want to, get it signed, and until it's found to be bad, it's allowed to run in the kernel. Well, the world we've got. <laughs>